Hi guys, my name's Chris, and thanks for tuning in to the very first webinar uh, for Beyond the Ultimate. And I came up with this idea really off the back of getting asked a lot of questions from some of our guys that are, are up for uh, the races through 2016. But then I thought it'd also be a handy tool to kind of share a lot of stuff that I've learned over the years. Um, so it comes in two parts. This is going to be part one. And um, yeah, I hope you hope you enjoy it. So just to introduce me a little bit for those that don't know me, I've been a coach for over 10 years now. Uh, I own my own gym. I also train as an affiliated coach with the Sheffield Hallam University team. Um, and we kind of I head up the endurance stuff there with a guy called Alan Ruddock, who's another one of the BTU coaches. Uh, I program for world record holders, uh, age group triathletes and distance runners, uh, national competitors, right through to beginners, uh, the, the whole works over the time that I've been I've been training people. Uh, now that we have the facilities at the Sheffield Hallam, I get to test uh, and get my hands on a, a different variety of athlete, which is pretty cool. Um, I also do a bit myself. So in 2014, I ran and cycled around the coastline of the UK in 34 days. In 2015, I ran up Mount Kilimanjaro in 11 hours, self-supported. Uh, I'm going to be going back soon to try and break the British record, which is 10 hour 30, which I know I can do with good weather. And uh, in 2018, I'm aiming to break a world record, but I can't tell you what that is yet uh, because it's super secret. And for most of you that know me through here, I'm obviously the race director at Beyond the Ultimate, which uh, I think is one of the coolest jobs in the world because um, uh, I get to do things like this as well as go to some wonderful places around the world. So what I thought we'd do is kind of split up the two parts and I'll explain what we're gonna do um, in part one. But the overall idea of this is to be able to let you guys have the knowledge to write your own programs at a basic level and to kind of head in the right direction with your own training. So in part one, we're gonna work on the awareness of all the considerations, uh, sorry, you will have the awareness um, of all the considerations that are needed when we're programming for an endurance event. Okay, so we're going to go through everything that we need to be thinking of and how we can cover it. We need to recognize how the body adapts and the key adaptations that an endurance athlete will need. And then also we need a basic understanding of some mobility sequences, just a way that we think about them, um, because then you can go off and do your own research because obviously there's hundreds of mobility uh, movements and programs that you can do but at least if you know what you're looking for and you'll know what you're on the hunt for you'll be okay then part two that will be recorded separately <clears throat> and it'll be up in a couple of weeks time you'll be able to apply all the correct training methods to your own training so considering what we've learned in part one you'll be able to recognize what the most common causes of injury are so we're going to be talking a little bit about running form and how we can hold it through fatigue uh, we're also going to touch on the basic nutritional requirements that you need, not only for events like ours, but for other multi-stage ultras. And then basically to finish, we'll combine everything that we've learned and how we can structure that into a very basic program uh, that you can, you can take into your own training. So they're the learning objectives that we're gonna go through. And I thought we'd start off with the considerations. So what you're gonna be doing if you're trying to program for yourself and if you're trying to create your own programs, there's two sides that you've got to stand on. You've got to stand on the side of an athlete and as a coach. Now, if you haven't got the finances to pay for someone to do all of the coachy side, you can also you know, start delving into uh, that side of it. But a decent coach would take all of that right-hand column away from you. Uh, but as an athlete, your, your program is going to be completely dependent on your experience the type of event that you're training for, whether it be a multi-stage, whether it be a one-day event, whether it be self-supported, or you are su supported through the race, uh, whether it's gonna um, involve any kind of climate or anything like that. So there's a whole range of events that are included in a multi-stage ultra, uh, in any kind of ultras, uh, whether it be a marathon on trail to road, you know, that all these types of things will depend on, um, you'll have to consider because you would train differently for it. So someone that's training for a marathon would train completely different really to, uh, well, not completely different, but they train quite differently to someone that's training for an ultra marathon and so on, so on, so on. Um, and then there's also the thing to 
to uh, consider where if you're in it to complete or compete. So if you're training to, uh, i.e. get a top five to top 10 finish, you'll be training slightly differently uh, to someone that is just looking at completing. And a lot of the guys that do the ultras nowadays are just in it to get across the finish line because of the mileage being so high. So that'll be a, a consideration that you'll need to you'll need to take on board. And then once again, it goes in line with your experience, but your current state. So you might be experienced, but you might have been out of action for four to five months. So your current strength, your current diet, your, where you are in your mobility, the, the base that you have, your, your aerobic foundation, the gait in which you run and cadence, because these can all be affected off after a long rest. Um, and then this is a concept that uh, I came across on a talk a couple of years ago, and it, it defines people as either a player, a piano player or a piano pusher. And it basically means that there's two types of people. So typically a piano player will like intricacy, they'll like to be uh, calm, they'll like structure, where a piano pusher, they're the ones that like to know that they've done a hard session, that they have worked hard, they'll be wanting to leave each training session sweaty and pushed to their limit. And really, by me saying that, you'll have already kind of categorized yourself into, into one of those uh, categories. Obviously, some people will be a little bit of a mixture of, of the two, which is ideal. But some people are very heavily a player and don't like to go all out every session, but like to develop over time with structure. And there are people that don't like structure that just like to turn up, absolutely hammer out a sprint session um, and and get it done. And to be honest, there's a lot of people in the kind of old school method of running now that are, are, are changing from pushers to players because there there's a there's a load of different things in the industry now that allow them to do that. Um, body composition is going to be uh, a crucial thing that you'll also need to consider when you're looking at the amount of mileage you're doing in a week. So, uh, is your body fat high? Because weight is pretty important when it comes to running, especially long distance, just like cycling, power to weight ratio is pretty important. And then the management of expectations. So are you training for something that is completely out of your league or is it within your reach? Because the ultra community has the constant ability to surprise me in, in what it can do. So uh, we had some people on our jungle this year that had very little experience that managed to get to the end. Uh, and there was some people with a lot of experience that fell short. And uh, but you need to manage those expectations and not walk into an event thinking that you're going to breeze it. Uh, because as we all know that have competed in in the longer races, just one little slip up or one bit of bad luck and your, your whole event can change. But that's you as an athlete. You as a coach is a different thing now. So what we also have to think about is the training methods that we're going to use. Are we going to use high intensity? Are we going to do slow heart rate training? Are we going to use plyometrics? There's, a, there's hundreds and hundreds of different training methods um, none of them are, are perfect, none of them are the, the only way to do them, we're going to talk about that today. Testing, that's something that a lot of people don't do, but testing yourself, if it's a, just a case of doing a simple 5k and seeing if you're faster a few months later, you could do things like ramp testing, uh, which is done on a treadmill where you take your incline up every minute and see how long you can go for. There's a whole range of tests that we can do. Uh, it might not even be to test your running ability, it might be to test your mobility. So if you can do a toe touch, can you do it a month later? Uh, things like that. These are all things that we want to consider right at the beginning when doing a program. The data collection that we use. So how are we going to be able to tell that we are improving? Are we going to be uh, tracking our runs? I'm guessing most people here use things like Strava and things. But are we actually going to look at the data? Are we going to look to see if we've sped up over time? Are we going to be working on PRs? Because PBs and PRs aren't the only way um, to improve. So we can work on how much data we're gonna collect. Are we gonna start recording our food? Are we gonna track our weight? Are we gonna track our heart rate daily? These are all different things that we can do. The support, that's something that um, you're gonna need to have around you, especially for the longer events. It's very important that you have the support at home and the understanding because people um, can get really uh, fed up of <laughs> of a partner who's completely obsessed with one uh, event or task. Uh, I completely know how that feels, being with um, people 
Well, I don't know how it feels actually because I am the one that puts them through that. But I can imagine it's not a, it's a nice thing the whole time. But a supportive partner, a supportive family is going to be great. Uh, or even the support on the event. What support team are you going to be bringing out with you? Um, your specific role would be um, how how involved are you going to become? Uh, are you going to be in this programming? Are you going to write all of your program? Or are you going to write the base of it and get someone to check it over that knows... Uh, how to write a decent program or are you going to get someone to write you a program and then you're just going to adjust it to what works for you so you need to decide how much of a, a coaching role you're going to take in this because this is why a lot of people will outsource to a coach because of time it takes a lot of time to do these things and take these considerations in how uh, much detail you're going to spend on your specific program so how intricate are you going to make it how much of a, a piano player are you because you could design the most beautiful intricate program in the world but if you can't stick to it it's the worst program it's not suitable so how much detail are you going to go into how long are your sessions going to be and how frequent are they going to be and also another big thing is your rest time how long are you going to rest in between these sessions are you going to look at two to three days you're going to do double up runs where you run in the morning and the evening the minimum requirements for that event are you going to be able to make sure that you can program to at least the minimum requirements to make the cutoffs and even the taper how are you going to structure a taper to um the event are you going to taper or are you just going to go all out research that we're doing at beyond the ultimate at the minute with shane benzi uh, is actually looking at that and the immune system into endurance athletes it's actually showing that uh, a, a a very um a low taper in what I mean by that is if we rest completely there can be a massive drop in the immune system before an event so people are typically turning up to events ill so is a taper the best thing should we be taking our volume down or should we be completely resting or what should we be doing we're going to discuss all of these things and after this uh, little talk today you should have an idea on some of these considerations so what I want to talk about firstly is how our body works in a simple way and what we need to do to make it adapt so we have three energy systems in our body all right so our body will draw on energy in three different ways we have our atp system we'll have our anaerobic system and we'll have our aerobic system okay and what's typically learned some of you guys might have done this back in the day in school but our atp system is our immediate source of energy so if you were sat down and you went to stand up and go get a cup of tea you would use that ATP system. It provides you with a couple of seconds worth of energy, okay? But it also allows you to be able to be ready and prepped if you need to go from a standing start to a jump, you have that energy in your system. Anaerobically, we can function without the use of oxygen uh, for a certain amount of time. And typically sprinters will be very good in this particular circle, in this zone here, if I can find my mouse, in this zone here. These are the, um, this will be the circle that will be developed. Um, and that's done mainly by high intensity training. And then we have aerobic, which is use of oxygen. Um, and this is what our, we need to work on. This is what we need to make sure that we develop. Now, the reason why I've displayed it in these circular forms like this is because when we talk about ATP being the first couple of seconds and then we go to anaerobically and then we go to aerobic, it doesn't necessarily work like that. There's actually a crossover and these little sections here, they all switch on at the same time and our body will adjust accordingly. So if we go out for a run, um, what first happens in the first couple of steps is this system will start kicking in, then this, uh, sorry, they, all of these will kick on um, at the same time. This system will be used uh, for the first couple of seconds, but then it will shift over here and then shift over here. So it kind of works in this um, zone here, and the ATB is constantly being restored, and our anaerobic systems are constantly working as well as our aerobic systems in some capacity. But what we need to do is we need to make this circle larger. And what we mean by our aerobic system is the way that our muscles are used to a higher capacity and workload, that our cardiovascular system, i.e. Uh, our heart is larger and it's, uh, it, can, it can work better, uh, that's suited to aerobic training, so it can pump more blood to those muscles and help get rid of lactic acid buildup. Our respiratory system, so our lungs are bigger 
and our uh, capillaries and our mitochondria that hold in our blood are more useful and adapted to aerobic exercise and long activity and even the nervous system you know uh, is our nervous system in somewhat numbed so it can deal with all of the impact uh, that we have when we run but is it also uh, fine-tuned so we can hold form through fatigue and these four little things are all things that will adapt to when we train in a certain way and what we're going to talk about now on our next slide is ways that we can work each one of these two okay and how we can develop each one because we've discussed for a multi-stage ultra and for a long endurance event we need to develop this um, but what I also like to work with all of my athletes is this section here and work to make sure they can still do some anaerobic um, exercising so that it basically they're adaptable so you're not all entirely aerobic uh, in part two we're going to discuss why that's a bad thing um, but so we're adaptable and we can actually do a bit of a sprint when we want to even so we can run for a long period of time but every now and again we can burst in to these short amounts of energy that our energy systems use here and we can we can go and do that and we've got that sprint in us still so there's different ways that we can cause an adaptation and these aren't the only way but these are the best ways to do it so anaerobically without the use of oxygen which is high intensity training okay um i've just realized that should be another i rather than the t i apologize but high intensity interval training is a great way to do that now what people do with high intensity trainers they make their sessions about 45 minutes but a true high intensity session should, shouldn't really last longer than 20 minutes okay it would only last half an hour if you was including your warm-up and your cool down within that time but if you were doing a true high intensity session it's disgusting and horrible all right so you should be working at your axum, absolute maximum for about 20 to 30 seconds even you can go down to 15 seconds so between 15 and 30 second sprints with a decent rest time in between but making sure that your sprint time is at the absolute maximum so as an example we could get onto a bike we could do a one minute rest and then a 30 second stood up Mac, like big resistance all out sprint as hard as we can do for 30 seconds and then we get a minute rest and we repeat for 10 so that's a very good example of how we can develop anaerobically for an endurance athlete and i do that with a lot of my um my long distance runners okay and the reason why i use the bike as well is because you don't have to worry about form and there's no impact on the joints and we can just go ahead and make sure that all the only thing they have to focus on is burning their legs out and getting tired okay but the good thing about anaerobic training is it's time efficient it's quickly, um, it's more suited for body comp improvement. So if you're carrying a bit more body fat, it does help in getting that body fat down lower quicker uh, in most cases. It's often fun to test. So even if you was doing it on a rower, you could see how far you can row in two minutes or a minute uh, or you know over five minutes with a couple of sprints in and see how far you can go or the power you generate on a bike. And then it's a good test uh, mentally because that's the feeling this suits the pushes the piano pushes because you are knackered and you're exhausted and you feel like you're pushed to your limit okay and that will uh, change our anaerobic system all right now aerobically for uh, an endurance athlete the best way is a, is a block method and an even better way to do that is heart rate training okay so a lot of you people might have heard of this before but what this does um, is gets you into a certain heart rate zone and you go at that pace and you hold it for as long as you can within you know a week or within your session time okay so what it, it typically is if you have a heart if you do a lactate test and you can establish your heart rate zones i'm not going to go too much into that because uh, there's about five or six different methods in which you can work that out but a lactate test nowadays only costs about 15 pounds uh, sorry 50 pounds and you can get um, your heart rate zones worked out for you and once you've got that they don't re they don't really change um, drastically you'd only need to get one done every couple of years but if you don't want to do heart rate training you can do the block method in which case you just get at a speed that you would typically be uh, under a marathon pace so for example if you had a marathon runner who could run a marathon in four hours you would typically take your pace down and you would um, to about nine kilometers or eight and a half kilometers and you would run at that uh, pace for a, a block of six weeks every time you run you would stick at that pace and you wouldn't go above it 
And what you're looking at doing is you're looking at becoming more efficient, and you'll hear that word a lot, in that heart rate zone. So you're not worried about your speed, you're wanting to bring your heart rate lower uh, and you, at, at the same speed. So if you are running at 148 beats per minute, and uh, or your block is 148 to 158 beats per minute, and you're running at nine and a half kilometers, but then in six weeks time, you're running at the same speed, but your heart rate's at 138 to 148, you know that your heart has got bigger and your body has adapted aerobically because your heart rate is lower and you're using less energy and you're running at the same speed, okay? And that's the way we need to develop, all right? And there's too many people that will go out and try and do these sprinting sessions and develop their anaerobic system when realistically for a, a multi-stage ultra, the only area we should probably be sitting in is this aerobic um, system for as long as we can, all right? Um, the good thing about that is it's lower intensity and less risk of injury if you do it properly. If you're slowing down and you're running slowly, as long as you keep your cadence at a respectable level, you uh, are lowering your impact as well. Uh, the recovery is easier to optimize. So because the training is less intense, your recovery time often goes down um, or your needed recovery time goes down. There's also an increase in measurable data if you start heart rate training because you've got your heart rate um, throughout your training so you can see where you spike and things and you can compare quite easily using a lot of the software now my job as a coach has become a lot easier over the last couple of years because of all the software that's coming out there's less stressful variables as well if you use time as a variable all right so what I mean by that is rather than saying I'm gonna run for 50 miles this week you can say I'm gonna run for a total time of 8 to 10 hours this week again okay? it seems less stressful uh, because you can fit in half hour blocks and the mileage isn't important. So as you start to speed up um, or slow down through tiredness, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how fast you're running because it's just about spending time in that particular heart rate zone. And it's more linear results. People tend to improve slowly and very consistently over time when they stick to it. But the method that I tend to bring in with a lot of athletes, and this is a good mix to have, is the polarized method, all right? And that means that you sit 80% of your time in an aerobic zone, i.e. low intensity or heart rate training or this block method, and 20% of your time is done anaerobically, okay? Um, and that will make sure that we develop this area here as well so we're not too one-sided we're not just what a one-trick pony we can go into this anaerobic and that is great the polarized method is great if we're looking at speeding up so once you've um, done a bit of heart rate and block training and once you've done a bit of that you can structure it to 20 percent if you use time as a variable again rather than mileage you can say i've done five hours of running this week so 20 percent of that time i'm going to spend doing high intensity training and that's going to work really well um towards hitting you know getting you faster and making these adaptations happen but what we're ultimately looking for i discussed it there is this sentence here we are looking for key physiological adaptations to take place the outcome of which is normally an increase in speed for the same heart rate and or a higher lactate turn point okay so what that means is you are improving your efficiency and your um making sure that you use less energy for the mileage that you're covering, okay? Or the speed um, that is gonna go up for the same amount of energy, okay? Either adaptation would be fine, all right? A higher lactate turn point, meaning basically, endurance athletes are very, very typical in getting to, and you'll, you'll, it'll sound familiar when I talk about this, but you would be fine running at like say 13 kilometers an hour, but as soon as we take it to 14 kilometers an hour, you start to feel tired. And as soon as you turn it to 15 kilometers an hour, you've only got about a minute or two in the tank, okay? And that is because your lactate turn point might be 14 or 15 kilometers an hour, all right? So it's in which case your body, uh, lactate turn point is in which case your body cannot deal or cannot flush out the lactate from your muscles um, or in your blood effectively, and therefore you need to stop, all right? So your, your turn point can be changed by your body's ability to get rid of that lactate or it can actually be your tolerance to that that turn point and that's what high intensity training is very good at as well because with high intensity training you will build up a tolerance to that burn and to that ache and to that pain so but the specific the very specific adaptations that happen 
is left ventricle eccentric hypertrophy. It sounds kind of posh. So we always say that a bigger heart is, you know, we want to grow our heart, which is our most important muscle for a runner, is the most important muscle that we, we want to be using. Okay, more, more so than because it dictates on how we're going to run and how we're going to be able to go long term. But very specifically, our heart doesn't only just get bigger, but the left ventricle of the heart ha grows in size of its chamber. And that's why when you're fit with an aerobic system, when you've got a well adapted aerobic system, your heart rate, natural or resting heart rate, will decrease because your left ventricle can store more blood. So the stroke volume increases, meaning that you can get blood around the body with uh, less strokes of the, the heart. Typically, if you had a sprinter who was well adapted anaerobically rather than aerobically, meaning that they function really well for 10 to 20 seconds, but couldn't really go on a long distance run um, very like easily, they would be uh, obviously adap adap adapted with a bigger heart as well, but they have left ventricle concentric hypertrophy, meaning that the muscles of the wall get thicker, which allows the heart to beat harder, but they can't hold as much blood typically as what a very adapted endurance athlete could. So that there, it's actually quite typical for someone that's adapting anaerobically for the heart rate, resting heart rate to go up. So don't feel if, you're, if your heart rate's um, not dropping, it doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world. Um, it could be that if you're doing a lot of HIIT or anaerobic training, um, it could go up from that. But what I would typically expect from anyone that's not a, an absolute elite athlete is that heart rate should drop regardless, okay? An increase in mitochondria will actually happen as well, which means that your uh, oxygen will get into uh, your muscles a lot more effectively, okay? And we'll be able to, at a cellular level, be able to function a lot better. And then we'll also have an increase in lung capacity. So our lungs will be able to hold more uh, oxygen within them. They'll be able to inflate larger. And that's what we're ultimately looking for. They're the adaptations that we need to happen because when they happen, and when they occur, we, and we can go for a longer period of time using the same amount of energy, okay? So if you look at someone like Killian Jornet, they will be, their lact his lactate turn point will be incredibly high. Like Mo Farah, for example, his lactate turn point would probably be about 20 kilometers an hour, or 21 kilometers an hour, maybe even higher, okay? Where the average person will probably be, average endurance athlete would probably be about 12 to 13. Um, the lung capacity, Killian Jornet's VO2 max is about 102, I think it got recorded at, where Lance Armstrong, even at his peak, and with the use of drugs, was in the 90s. Okay, so very, very, um, very adapted athletes. And that comes with a mix of genetics and just the effective training that goes with it. Okay, so outside of that, what we also need is mobility. Okay, now mobility is a very important word and that's why I've made it larger in the title. So a lot of runners will go for flexibility. And flexibility is not important for a runner um, because it doesn't matter how far or how bendy you are. If you lack strength, they're still gonna get injured, okay? So mobility is basically, it's defined as flexibility plus strength, all right? We need to be flexible. We need to get into the positions that we need to get into run. And typically, if we're doing the same repetitive movements like we do when we run, we can tighten up in areas, in certain areas, like the psoas muscle, the hamstrings, the glutes, because they're either constantly being put through the same plane of motion or they're switched off, all right? But we have to be strong at the end ranges of movement, all right? And we're gonna discuss a little bit on the next slide, I'm gonna show you some examples, all right? But what we're inevitably training for is the wrong step because like, it's going to happen it's going to happen we are, all make a wrong step our ankles will roll we'll overstride and our hamstrings will take the brunt of the move, the fall okay and this is what i specialize in the most is kind of building strong runners um so we need to make sure that we're strong at the end ranges so that when we do take the wrong step our body can deal with it and it's got the capacity to deal with that high workload or that high amount of force that may be thrust upon it uh out of it's normal plane or out of its normal comfort zone, all right? So we need to be comfortable at being uncomfortable, really. And we can also break the rules. So for anyone that squats or anyone that knows kind of what they're doing in the gym, you're always taught to squat 
with your knee over your second toe. It's not necessarily the case because you think about it when you're running, especially downhill or you're trail running, you're twist and turn, your knee goes over your toe a lot. If you ever look at a slow motion video of a trail runner, knee, so what's the point of squatting knee behind toe? Okay, so we can break the rules a little bit and as long as it's controlled, we can, we can squat with knee over toe because it'll actually be sport specific to what we want to do, all right? Eccentric loading is a really good way to build strength at the end range. So what that means is there's two types of contraction. So if you bring your arm out in front of you now and just bring your palm facing up, and if you do it with me, so you know. If you bring your middle finger to touch your shoulder, so a bicep curl, your bicep is concentrically contracted, meaning it's shortened. If you let, bring your arm back into that position that it started with slowly, it's now eccentrically moving. Okay, so it's stretching. And what we need to do is work the muscle in that plane of motion. So if you go back to your shoulder, that's a concentric movement where it shortens, and that's what we typically train a lot when we do weight training. But eccentrically loading will mean that we are strong at our end ranges as well, meaning that we can bear that workload if we need to. All right. So we need to build dynamic mobility movements into a program. There's a difference between dynamic, dynamic mobility movements and just stretching. All right? Stretching for flexibility just simply does not work and has no use. All right? It is useful maybe to get into a little bit of a position before we uh, exercise. I would definitely not stretch after running when muscles are fatigued, but mobility movements are amazing, not only for making sure that we move better and we move in a, an amazing way, but that we can actually use them to recover. So even yoga, yoga is a classic example when you're transitioning from movements of dynamic movement rather than stretching. So you will typically be in a position, then you will move around in that position and then you'll transition to another one. And even things like crawling and things like that are an example of dynamic movements, okay? Um, to help prevent injury as well and um, make sure that we stay mobile, we need to plan our rest to optimize our recovery, all right? Muscles become tight and they shorten when they're fatigued, okay? If we're resting and we're making sure that we've got enough rest time and they're not short in the first place, we're more likely to stay injury free and, and mobile and, and supple, is probably the better word to use, all right? And using that, uh, I'm not gonna touch on super compensation because that's, I could go on for about an hour with that stuff, but, this is basically proving that foam rollers are not a long-term solution. I won't even use them. I'll only use them to just release an area sometimes if it's really particularly tight and I can't even move into a position. And people are too, uh, people are too easy to grab a foam roll and thinking, I'm just gonna do this and it's gonna sort it out. It won't sort the problem out long-term. Often adding a compression to an injury caused by compression as well is often a bad case. I, if you start adding a foam roller or stripping into your IT band and that IT band is originally sore because of compression of overuse, it's not the best thing to do. It's just a short term solution to a long term problem. It's just going to come back. And it seems like a lot of pain for not a lot of, uh, of, gain back okay i would want to make sure that if i was in that amount of pain if i'm going to be moving around in these mobility sequences i'm in uh, i'm uncomfortable at least i know i'm getting a lot back out of it and then we also need to be consistent so it's all right doing mobility movements for you know at once a week and then falling off the pattern of it when we start to tighten up and increase our miles they need to be done consistently and what we can also do is control the controllable variables so what i mean by that is making sure and consistency is very important for us as runners very important that we control these variables so our footwear is the same and we're not swapping out of footwear all the time that we are on a similar terrain or if we can if we transition across. So if we've been doing six to eight hour weeks on road, don't think that you can just transition to a six to eight hour week of trail or fell. Okay, so control the control of variables. The ones that you can control, do that. Um, and then also coaching basic running form uh, and having cues that you can uh, rely on will make sure that we don't overuse the same muscles or when we get fatigued, um, and our form changes because that's another thing we might start off when you have your form checked with a running coach you're often fresh 
But what does that form look like when you're tired? Can you hold form through fatigue? And these different things are the reason why we need mobility to make sure that we can hold strength through our running form through a long period of time. So here's some examples of some mobility. And if we look at the bottom here, now this is a great example, and this is what I use as a, a, a way of explaining the difference between flexibility and mobility. And you can try this out yourself at home. So what I've got Rich here doing is he's lined up against the wall to make sure his bum and his back stay on the wall at all times. And he's lifted his knee up to his stomach as high as he can go, which shows you how flexible his hip flexors are and into his psoas region. Now, if he let go of his leg there, and I asked him to hold that position with his leg, his leg would drop by about three or four inch, okay? And what that shows is that he's got the flexibility with assistance, with his hands, to get into this top position, okay? So he can fle he's flexible enough, if he uses his hands, his body can go into that position. But as soon as he lets go and his knee drops, he hasn't got the strength to hold that position. So if he overstrides and he fell on a run and his body went into this position here without assistance and with force, it will, he will damage his hip flexor, okay? That's the way it works because his body hasn't got the strength to be able to deal with that position. So what we need to work on is be able to move up, hold into that position with his hands and let go of his hands and make sure he can hold that position and keep it there comfortably without any drop, all right? So it's a perfect example and a, a, a good way of showing the difference between flexibility and mobility. Here's an example of a, a basic exercise I do with uh, runners that to build that strength up in the knees, okay? So if you already have knee problems or you're suffering with these, this is an advanced movement, so you wouldn't start off with this, but all I'm doing is I'm raising his heels and I'm slowly getting him to squat, very slowly and controlled, so his knees are right loaded over his toes and he can, he'll feel that load in the knees, but getting used to that loading is a good thing, good thing there. And having his heels on there, he doesn't have to worry too much about the form of his squat. He can just get what we want out of it. And you can see there, the amount of force and pressure that will be going into that knee will be really good for making sure that knee is conditioned to uh, pressure and overuse. Uh, the hip flexors, uh, sorry, the, the glute med. Okay, so this is a crab walk. And this is an example of a mobility drill rather than just stretching the glute med. So rather than just a static stretch where we extend our leg out to the side and hold it. This is a good mobility movement that we can do where we add a little bit of resistance as well and build strength into there. So he's in a three quarter squat. He's got a resistance band around both legs and all he's gonna do is walk to the side. So he'll bring that foot to this foot and then he'll step out with his left foot and he'll walk like a crab and he'll do you know eight to 10 lengths of a room under constant tension. So he's in this three quarter squat the whole time. And what that does is it works the glute med, which is a small muscle at the side of the glute that extends the leg outwards, okay? And it's, it involves as well in abducting the hip. Now, that will typically get tired when um, we run for long distances because it's a small muscle, it fatigues first. And that's what, what will make our uh, hips drop so our hips will move laterally and it'll build pressure into the IT band. So with that hip drop, pressure will start to build through the side of the knee or at the top of the hip. And that's a very common cause for ITB syndrome is having weak glute meds. So that's a good movement and mobility drill for that. Um, a foot drag. So this is a static movement to begin with. That there helps stretch out the intrinsic part of the feet and the toes, which are really toe flexibility and intrinsic foot strength is vital for a, a runner. But what we, he's gonna do is he's gonna dip his knee a little bit and drag his foot, okay? Now I have a client that cramps up the second they do this, which is a sign that his foot muscles are really tight. But dragging that foot along the floor will not only stretch that, but it'll also put a nice stretch into the tib anterior, which is a short muscle that sits from the knee down to here. And that muscle there is the reason why a lot of people get shin splints, is tightness and um, impact through this point here. So stretching into that muscle is a really good way of doing it. So foot drags are a great way of that. And intrinsic foot strength, this is a good way. Towel crunches, so picking up things with your feet is a great way to build intrinsic foot strength. If you think about the amount of times that the small muscles in our feet are gonna be used, I could do an hour's talk on just that. Um, but you think about the, the amount of muscles that are getting used in our feet when we run and we neglect them when it comes to strength training. So picking up things, so picking up towels, picking up wet towels with your feet uh, or heavier things, just see what you can get up and making sure that we can crunch our toes right in without cramping. 
Okay, it's a really great way to develop int intrinsic foot strength. And this is a three part movement pattern. So this is three movements that we connect together to make sure that we are stretching the muscles that we need to stretch. So we can do a toe touch, and I've got a bent knee with Rich here because he was feeling pain into the back of his knee. So if you feel pain into the back of your knee while you're going down to touch your toe, it's because you're getting it through your sciatic nerve. So just bend your knee slightly, but make sure your hips go back. What you can do to start with is put your bum against the wall to make sure that you're not cheating and low using your back, or you can go sideways to a mirror to make sure that your back's not rounded. You've got a nice straight back. Bring your bum out and bow into a toe touch. Okay, so that's part one. Part two of the movement is then to bring your bum as close down, so just sit down into a squat. And so a lot of runners can't do this because of tight psoas muscle. If you can't get your bum into that position, you know you've got tight psoas, you need to work on this movement <coughs> to make sure that you can get into the position. You can even push onto the inside part of your knees with your elbow to stretch into your inner thigh. All right, so that's another movement. And then stretching your hands up into the air, you'll get a nice stretch through your thoracic spine into your T-spine, and then you'd stand up from that squat after holding it for a second, and then you'd repeat, okay? Now, nine out of 10 runners can't do that movement well, okay? Guarantee it, so that's why I put it in here, because you can test yourself and see how you do. So there's some example of some mobility, and that is the end of part one, all right? So, a lot of things in that that didn't make sense will probably make more sense when we do part two in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about the structuring of programs, how you can actually structure all of that within a program and ideas that I'm going to give you. Um, but in the meantime, if you've got any questions, you can find us on Facebook. So there's our own Facebook group at Beyond the Ultimate Race Series. There's Project Breaking Point, which is my own athletic kind of page where I do all my challenges and things. Uh, on Twitter, we're on at Ultimate Updates and my own at Coach Kingy, so you can contact me there if you have any questions. You can find us on Instagram and on YouTube. I'll be on the Ultimate channel there where you can subscribe. But if you want to contact me directly and you don't want to do it through any of these, you can email us, uh, email me, sorry, at chris at beyondtheultimate.co.uk. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope um, I've tried to keep it relatively short, so uh, not to bore you for a long period of time. Uh, like I said, we're going to be touching up on that and going into a little bit more detail and uh, going into nutrition on part two. So stay tuned for that and enjoy your running. I'll speak to you all soon.